Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Diane DiBasella, and I am the director of the Fiscal Sponsorship Program here at Fractured Atlas. I just want to make sure that you can all hear me okay. Uh, if you can use the question functionality to just let me know that the sound is okay and that you can hear me clearly, that would be great. Okay, it doesn't... Oh, yes, great. <laughs> Thanks so much, everybody. All right, so um, welcome to the webinar on individual donors. Uh, as I said, my name is Diane DiBasella, and I am the program director for the Fiscal Sponsorship Program here at Fractured Atlas. I am recording the webinar today, so um, if you miss anything or you wanted to share this with any of the people that you work with, I'd be happy to send you a recording um, of the entire webinar after it's over. So this webinar is going to focus on how to engage your donors, how to keep them, um, as well as we'll cover how to put together an individual appeal letter, and I'll also give a brief introduction to fundraising. But first, it's nice to virtually meet you. I am in the middle, um, circled in red. I'm Diane, and um, this is the team of people that I work with at Fractured Atlas that help to support the Fiscal Sponsorship Program. To my left is Lauren, who is a program associate. Beneath Lauren is Teresa, who is a program specialist. To Teresa's right and underneath me is Courtney, who is a member advisor. To the right of Courtney is Nathan, who is a program specialist. And to my right and above Nathan is Aisha, who is a program special, a program associate. So if you are working with us at Fractured Atlas, you could be dealing with any of us at any time. We work really closely together to try to manage and answer all of your questions and be available um, for, for anything that comes up. I have been working at Fractured Atlas for the last 10 years, and in that time, my focus has been really on trying to help artists and arts organizations raise as much money as they can for their fiscally sponsored projects. In my time at Fractured Atlas, I've worked with organizations that have raised collectively over $75 million. So there's been a lot of money that has, has come through the program, and I'm really proud of the team that I work with and all of the artists that we support because they do most of the heavy lifting in terms of their fundraising. So to jump right in, to start talking a little bit about where your money is going to come from when you're fundraising. I wanted to share a breakdown of the funds that were raised through our fiscal sponsorship program back in 2013. Um, and as you can see, more than 50% of the funding we received for the purposes of our fiscally sponsored projects came from individual donors, while less than 40% came from foundations and less than 10% from other sources. So this is something to keep in mind when you're thinking about where you want your money to come from, is that a large portion of it is likely to come from individual donors. So that's where you want to be spending most of your time when you're fundraising. This trend also is prevalent in major cultural institutions in the United States, and it shows us that we should really rely on individuals to fund the majority of our budgets. It's just sort of the reality of what the fundraising world looks like for the arts, and it's something that I try to stress to anybody who, who is either new to fundraising or even just um, coming back to it or continuously doing it. Individual donors are where you're going to see the most return on your investment of time. You might be thinking, but what about grants? Aren't they usually in larger sums and aren't they more reliable, reliable because they come from foundations and institutions? While grants can make up about a third of your contributed income, you unfortunately you can't rely on them because they are competitive and they may not come in year after year. Statistically, grants are the most competitive type of support that exists and they, they have been decreasing year over year throughout the United States for the arts. So it's not where you want to put all of your, your eggs in one basket because um, it's, it's not going to be 100% of your contributed revenue. Really the best way to create a sustainable funding model is to build a donor base made up of many individuals rather than just a few grants that may or may not come through the following year. So if you are able to get a grant one year, that's great, but that doesn't mean that you'll also get that grant again the year after and the year after. So how 
do we find donors? Cultivating individual donors is not just about asking for money. It's really about articulating what your vision is and what results you're anticipating for the work that you're doing. You need to be able to tell a compelling story to people that are potential donors, and you need to be willing to think in terms of expanding the movement. So um, fundraising is not just about you getting the money to actually produce your work, but it's also about creating the opportunity for others to be part of the solution. So you're presenting them with something that you're trying to get done, and you're asking for their help, and you're asking them to become a part of it. And it's important to, to make sure that you're offering them that value when you're asking them to contribute. One of the most important things that we try to stress to people when soliciting a donation is that it's not about begging for money. And that's a framework that I do hear a lot of artists come to us and say, I feel like I'm begging my, fa my friends and family when I'm asking them for money. What it's really about is conveying your vision and what impact you anticipate will result from your, your work. Your ultimate goal is not just to raise money, but to create something great and to share it with people. So that's what you need to be telling people and asking for people to become a part of. You really need to tell a compelling story so that your donors know what you're doing and exactly why you're doing it. And this is something that you know takes time to put together, but it is uh, an impactful way to make sure that, that people understand why they are going to be a part of what, whatever it is that you're making. Keep in mind that you're going to be expanding your movement. So in other words, you're inviting your donors to become part of your work and, and help you make an impact. We all need to understand that fundraising is about creating that opportunity for others to be part of a solution. So a lot of times donors are people that maybe they themselves are not artists, but they really value the arts and they want to be part of an artistic process. And that may be one of the ways that they're able to do that. So when you're starting off and you're trying to think about how you're going to tell your compelling story, how you're going to share your vision, how you're going to invite your donors to become part of your movement, you want to ask yourself a series of questions in order to figure out what to actually say to them. So for example, a great question to start for yourself if you're thinking about, I'm going to sit down, I'm just going to do some free form writing about my work in order to, um, to brainstorm and start putting some stuff on paper about my work. So one of the first things you should ask yourself is, why are you doing this? What is the compelling need or problem that your project addresses? Who is going to be affected by this problem or impacted by this situation? So in other words, who is your audience or who will you serve with this work? How is your project going to present an innovative solution or solve the problem at hand. And what do you bring to the solution? What are your unique skills? Who are you and, and why are you the person to actually make this work happen? What are your actual strategies to accomplish these goals? Now that you've, um, you have the questions to ask yourself, it's time to come up with answers to those questions. Offer a unique solution and really highlight your ability to carry out that solution. You can include the qualities of yourself and the people that you're working with, as well as the resources that you have available. You'll also want to point out that um, that there's benefits to your donors. So it's really important to appeal to your donors' humanity by letting them know the good that they're going to be doing by contributing and otherwise how, how the work is going to benefit them. These questions will help you to organize your thoughts before approaching potential donors. So once you've asked yourself these questions and, and you've answered them for yourself, you'll need to use this information to begin engaging potential donors. So the first thing to do is to identify the goals that you've come up with throughout that writing process. And then you need to figure out how to communicate them. You can start by develop, developing an image of what success looks like and really determine how you're going to measure your progress. 
Make sure you're keeping your goals and your objectives front and center so that your audience knows what you're trying to do and how they can help you. Your goals should really drive the campaign and the, the ask that you're putting out there for money. Make sure that you're taking into consideration your communication style and your voice. So keep track of what type of communication has results and adopt that style. Remember that different people might respond differently to different voices and, and different forms of communication. So you might need to adapt different styles depending on, depending on who you're approaching. And most importantly, remember to keep your communication personal. People really do respond to something that is a specific call to them and a specific note to them. So if you are using email as the forum to reach out to people, don't be afraid of you know, making sure that you select people that you know that are your nearest and dearest and personally emailing them. You may be sending them part of a boilerplate that you've created, but make sure that the beginning and the closing is personalized. If this is somebody that you know is going to respond better to a letter, make sure that you, of course, include something personal in the beginning or the closing. If it's a large donor that you were planning on asking them for a sum that you feel like they will be able to give, but you're you know, nervous about it, perhaps it's best to actually call them and approach them in a, a different way. Don't forget to use interactive tools. So the first time you hear something new, uh, what is the first thing you do to find out more information about it? In most cases, you'll do a Google search for that item, that company, or that person. And you want to make sure that your project is there for Googleable. Your projects should take up at least one search result on that first page of results in order to ensure more traffic. Make sure you keep an up-to-date website that is easy to navigate so your potential donors and your audience members can easily find the information they need about your work. They should not need to scroll or click more than twice to donate. This is really important. Make your donation page friendly and easy to use. For instance, if you, if you do have a donation tab in your website, make sure it is front and center. When they click on this tab, all of the information they need to donate should be right there with the link to your Fractured Atlas donation page. And if you're using Artfully, you do have the option to embed a donation widget right onto your website so that your donors are not led to Fractured Atlas's website to make the donation. This is a great solution if you're worried about the too many clicks problem, but you'll need to make it extra apparent that, that Fractured Atlas will be charging your donor's credit card. So just make sure that that's mentioned on the site. <clears throat> when you Google your project, one of the options will be your fiscal sponsorship online profile on Fractured Atlas's website. This pro profile should be updated regularly to reflect your current fundraising efforts and any current projects you're working on. So just make sure that you know, you've updated your photo or your video, that the description of your work is up to date, so that if people are going to it, they, they know it's there. Make sure that the giving levels are, are reflecting what you're currently offering people, um, and that's, that kind of stuff take, stays current. So what about social media? Obviously, you need to use it. Um, studies have shown that 96% of millennials have joined social networks and that the, the fast and growing demographic in social media is people over 50, which is a great demographic to be asking for donations. They are accustomed to giving. They are um, usually in an income bracket that they, they like to give to charities. So you should really consider the number of people that are using social media and the ease with which people can share information about your work. It can be really be one of the most important tools you use in your fundraising, and it can be especially helpful when you're running a crowdfunding campaign, as it's a really great way to help make your campaign go viral. Make sure that from start to finish, you are guiding your donors through the process. So it's important to be really clear about what you want from your donors and how they can give that to you. So you should give them really explicit instructions on how to donate. Make sure your instructions are easy to understand and clearly define each step your donors need to make in order to make the donation you've requested. We see a lot of appeal letters, individual appeal letters come through Fractured Atlas where 
people do not list the steps that the donor needs to take when they actually are going to contribute. So, you know, people, people know what an appeal letter is when they get it. And often they know whether or not they want to give right away. And what they're looking for in that letter is brief information, really specifically stating to them, this is what you need to do. So just make sure that you're putting that in any sort of um, appeal that you're sending out. You also want to clarify for your donors that they're, they'll contribute on Fractured Atlas's website and that their credit card statement and tax receipt will show Fractured Atlas as the donation recipient. So that's just really important to make sure that's clear to your donor so they're not confused as to why Fractured Atlas is charging their credit card. Make sure that you're specific about what you're asking for. So, you know, anybody can give support just by patting you in the back and saying, I support you. But when you want to be specific, um, you or sorry, you want to be specific about requesting a donation so that your donors understand what you're asking them to do. It's also important to make it clear that your goal is not to raise funds. Ultimately, you're trying to make art that will serve a greater art audience. So raising funds is just a, a means to an end that will help you to achieve those goals. This is really important when you're writing an individual appeal letter. You need to state up front in the first paragraph, I am looking to raise $10,000 for my artistic project. To date, I have raised $1,500. I am looking to raise the remaining $8,500. Will you help me today by contributing and give them a dollar amount. Um, that is one way to approach it. But I would definitely, within the first paragraph, state to the person that you are asking them to make a financial contribution. It's really important to be upfront about that and to make sure that it's not vague. Make sure that you reward your donors for your success. So your reward should be based on the amount of the donation that you're asking them to give. And it makes sense to make your donors feel especially important as a thank you for their contribution, especially if they're giving large amounts. So if you have somebody that's giving $1,000 to your work, you might want to think about inviting them to an open rehearsal or to have dinner with one of the artists. It doesn't make sense to offer those kinds of perks or rewards at a lower donation point because you'll obviously um, exhaust your resources too quickly. If, if most people are giving $30, you don't want to offer all of them to come to a rehearsal or to have dinner with an artist. But think about things that you can give them that are simple. Your rewards should definitely make sense with your mission. And they shouldn't break your budget. That's really important. So there's things like really simple things like handwritten thank you notes, um, invitations to uh, events, um, shout outs on social website, on your social media or your website, um, just different ways of incorporating them into the work. And again, for those those big donors, you know, maybe you want to do something like if you're making a film, offer that they can be an extra in the film or something like that. So we try to make it pretty easy for you to offer rewards to your donors by giving you the option to set up giving levels on our website. Your donors have the option then to select a giving level when they donate, and that then is tracked in your donation history. It also ensures that we're offering them the correct tax receipt. So if you, let's say you offer a donor um, a private dinner or a private reception or something like that, that has a financial value, you need to be able to issue a tax receipt to them that is appropriate. So you'll have to tell us what the value is of what you're giving them in exchange. And that'll be reflected in the giving level when they go to give, give on our website. So once somebody gives to you once, it's really important to remember that donors frequently give over and over again. A lot of donors have a certain amount per year that they are contributing to charities across the United States. And you want to think about developing that relationship in a way so that you can, you can continue engaging with them, continue having them be part of your work, and, um, and, and make sure that they understand that this isn't just a one-time thing, that you're going to be continuing this relationship. So a couple of ways that you can work on doing this are you can develop, let's say you have a advisory committee or a close group within your artistic practice of people that can help you stay connected to your donors. Make sure that when you receive a donation that you immediately, upon receiving the gift, write a personalized thank you to whoever has given to you. 
Make sure that you're keeping them up to date on your activities and you're inviting them to your work and make sure that they know what you're spending their money on. So if somebody sends you a check for $100 and you're planning on using that $100 to pay for two hours of rehearsal space, let them know that. Tell them, thanks to your contribution, our dance group was able to rehearse for two hours in this location. Show them what the space looks like. Tell them what you accomplished during that rehearsal. Really give them an insight into, into the work that you're actually doing. Make sure that you're using their preferred method of correspondence. So if you have noticed that um, a donor responds to you through email immediately, obviously use email. <clears throat> if they tend to text you, try to text them back and use that as their, their method if they like to be called. Just take note of that so you know how they like to be reached out to. And I do recommend um, a couple times a year that you survey your donors. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So I did mention writing a personalized thank you to your donor immediately upon receiving the gift. It is essential that you do this right away. And don't just use the tax receipt or if you're doing something on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, the automated email that goes out. Make sure that you actually write to them and say, I, I received this donation and I really appreciate it. Show them that it's actually from you and it's not just, you know, an automated, an automated message going out. Again, use their preferred method of correspondence. Um, and, you sh and you can be tracking this. We actually have our online system called Artfully that can help you with this. It's free to use and it can help you track how you've contacted your donors in the past and, um, and how, what they've responded to. So you can actually, you know, if a year later, if you're doing the same kind of appeal again, you could look back and say, well, I know that these people responded to the email and these people didn't or um, that, you know, these people saw my show and these people didn't. Just being able to, to know what happened and what, what didn't happen is a good way to evaluate sort of what you're doing. Um, Artfully, for those of you that are, are not familiar with it, is a product at Fractured Atlas. It is a web-based business software for artists that allows you to keep track of your patrons. It allows you to sell tickets. It allows you to take donations. Um, you can even note which method of course of correspondence produce results so that you consult that information the next time you go to contact a certain donor. So it's a great way um, to sort of manage your patrons and know who they are and what they're doing. Make sure that you're keeping people up to date on your activities. So invite them to your work and make sure that they know what you, what you use their gift towards. And surveying your donors. So ask them what they think of the communications you send. I would really suggest starting with your nearest and dearest, your friends and family. So don't survey every single one of your donors, but, you know, find five to ten of them and ask both those who have donated and those who haven't what they think about your solicitation. What did they like about it? What didn't they like about it? Um, what do they think you could have done differently? As you continue to expand your donor base, you should really to continue to survey your donors who are the most faith faithful people um, in order to continue refining the way you interact with them. This can really inform you going forward so that you know whether or not what you're doing works. And develop a, a team of people or an advisory committee that can help you stay on top of all of these things. They can help you write thank you notes or make calls to your donors. Um, they can be a group of people that help you stay connected with your donors and thank them for their gen generosity in a timely manner. So this might be something you want to think about scheduling out. If you are you know, sending everybody an individual appeal let letter, and let's say in mid-November, great time of the year to ask, and you're having, um, you set a sort of urgent deadline for your donors that you'd like them to, to contribute by December 15th. Put on your calendar that on December 16th, your committee is going to all sit down together to figure out the strategy for the rewards that you're giving out, for any thank yous that you still need to do, and for um, the sort of next steps to stay connected to those donors. It's important to consider 
the donor's perspective. So why are they giving? Why do they feel like they want to support your work? And there's a number of reasons why they do this. Um, the first is that they care about the success of you and of the work that you're producing. They might care about the audience you're serving and really want to help to bring your service to that audience. Perhaps they want to help in some way, but they can't give time, so they end up giving money instead. Some want the status. Some want to be elevated to you know, a certain place on your website or in your program. Um, they want to be so seen as somebody who is supporting the arts. And some just want the tax deduction. Some have a certain amount of money that they give each year to charities in order to um, reduce their tax burden. So, you know, some are just looking to make those contributions. It's important to think about as you're approaching people, why do you think that, they are that they'll are they be interested in giving? And it could be one of these reasons, or it could be all of them. It could be any combination of them. But it might um, make you adjust your approach differently if you think about the sort of profile of who they are and, and why they might want to give. So how do you get them to give? The first is that you need to have printed materi materials that are easy for donors to view. You need to have an accessible website, um, both which should be up to date. So your printed materials and your website should be regularly updated. You can also create opportunities for people to volunteer. Sometimes they want to be part of the work that's being produced. And um, maybe they can't financially give, but that is some, another way that they can give. If you have people that, you know, they say to you, I really would like to support your work, but I am financially not in a place to right now. Try to think in terms of what else could they do to help support the work. Are there materials that they might have access to that could help you out? Are there any in-kind donations that they could make that potentially could help the work move forward? Do they have an office space that you can meet in um, that they could donate to you, you know, a couple of times a year? Make sure that you're tracking your contacts all along the way so you know when you can you wrote to people or you um, or you ask them for money and you're tracking who has actually responded. If they can't give dollars, again, another thing that you can ask them to do is make sure that they're attending or going to see your work and ask them if they can tell somebody else about your work. You know, spreading spreading the word can be a powerful thing unto itself, and it's something that's not always easy to do just on your own. Make sure that throughout this entire process that you're staying positive. So having the right attitude and really believing in yourself as a leader and sh showing to your donors that what you have to offer is of great value and that you're offering them an opportunity is incredibly important. Keep in mind that you're not asking for a handout, but you're really offering to give them the opportunity to be part of something great and something that's beneficial to other people. You need to convey confidence about your project and you really need to show your competence and your capabilities. So don't ever apologize for, you know, the work that you're doing. Don't start things off by, um, you know, sharing something negative about the work or about the process or about how hard it is. Really try to stay upbeat and positive when you're talking to your donors. So I wanted to give you some concrete tips for individual appeal letters. Individual appeal letters, when I... Um, when I say individual appeal letters, they can these can be both mailed letters via the good old post, postal service, or you know something that you're sending out via email. But the important things to keep in mind are that you need to use really simple and straightforward language. Use a lot of nouns and verbs, and limit your use of adverbs and adjectives. Your donors are going to feel more engaged and will get the point much faster without using overly flowery language. Format your letter so that it's really easy to read. So break the letter into a couple of different paragraphs and use easy to read fonts. So sometimes we see people use fonts that are those like fancy cursive fonts. Uh, don't use that. It can be really hard for people to read if they're not accustomed to looking at that. Make sure that you keep the letter to one to two pages so that it does not take too much time for your donor to read. The longer it is, the more likely it is for your donors to stop reading. I really try to encourage people to keep their, their appeal letters to one page. 
Uh, I said this earlier, make sure you ask for money, not for support. And don't bury your ask. It is the purpose of the letter. So it is really appropriate to put your ask into the first paragraph of your letter. It is possible that your potential donors will not read until the end. So if you put your ask up front, they're at least going to get that message, even if they don't read the whole letter. Give them a reason to send money now. So this is what I like to refer to as creating a sense of urgency. They need to know that you need the money now and not in six months. So let them know that you need you know, $10,000 by such and such a date in order to make this particular initiative successful. Uh, I always like to use the example of my mom, actually. Um, Fractured Atlas, you know, we're a nonprofit, so we do our own fundraising at Fractured Atlas. And um, Fractured Atlas every year sends an appeal letter to my mom. And my mom has been supporting Fractured Atlas for years, but I was visiting her one summer and she's had this letter on the counter from Fractured Atlas and this pile of other stuff. And I, I said, oh, you got a, an appeal letter from Fractured Atlas. And she said, oh, yeah, I'm saving it to the end of the year when I make my annual, my annual contributions to, to charities. So she was holding it until December because that's for her when she makes her contributions to charities. And Fractured Atlas had not put anything in the letter stating, you know, that there was a specific deadline or a specific need for the, the money to be contributed sooner. So just remember that, that some people are, they do think in terms of like, I make my donations at the end of the year. And maybe that's fine for you. But if you do need the money sooner than that, make sure that you're being explicit about what you need it. Um, make sure that you use, you use I and you, but mostly you. You're going to emphasize how this is going to benefit your donor. So using the word you will help to emphasize the fact so that your donors benefit from this is very clear so they can know this is why they're going to be a part of it. Make sure you base the appeal on benefits and not needs. So you don't want to come off as needy in your letter. So make sure to speak less about your needs and more about the benefit to not only your donors, but also to the intended audience of the people you're trying to serve. You're ultimately creating this work for someone or a group of people. So talk about the benefit to them as well. Make sure that you, you know, look online. There are a lot of great examples of individual appeal letters online that you can use to help guide you if you're stuck. We also have a template on our website that can help you get started if it's your first time writing one. Don't forget that if you are fiscally sponsored by Fractured Atlas, you need to have these letters approved before you send them along to your donors. So you just need to email us a copy of the letter and we will review it and give you feedback on it within one to five business days. Uh, we try to turn them around as quickly as possible, but it sort of depends on what the volume is like on any given day. So how can you make sure that you are getting the most out of your solicitations? There are a couple of ways um, that you can help to maximize the amount of donations that you are receiving. So first off, monthly donations are important for any fundraising campaign because they allow your donors to contribute less at one time, which allows for them to give more over time. So if we look at a, a typical donor profile, comparing monthly donors versus one-time donors. As you can see, even without the year-end contribution, the, month, the monthly donor still gives $65 more during the course of the year. Overall, monthly donors are seven to 10 times more valuable over the long term than regular donors. So even though it might sound like, oh, $20, I got a $20 monthly pledge, it doesn't sound that exciting, um, it can actually add up pretty quickly. So don't, don't be afraid of pushing people in that direction. We try to make it easy for your donors to give monthly through our website. Um, at the time that they are on our website and they click on the Donate Now button, this little window pops up asking them if they want to give just once or if they want to give today and again every month. Their credit cards then, if they do select today and again every month, will be charged automatically on the same day every month. So, you know, try to make sure in your appeal letter that you're mentioning this as an option to people. Uh, I mentioned non-cash gifts earlier, 
but these are a great way to increase the revenue that you are bringing in for the project. You can often eliminate your budget items by asking for a non-cash gift. This is really important if your donor cannot offer funds, but let's say they have equipment or other materials to contribute. Remember that only tangible items are considered tax deductible according to the IRS. So Fractured Atlas can process donations of tangible items and offer your donors tax receipts for those donations. We, see, we process a lot of non-cashed gifts for our fiscally sponsored projects. And this ranges from, you know, somebody might want to host an, um, an, a fundraising event for you at their house. And they want to purchase all of the food and the alcohol for it. So we can issue a tax receipt for the food and the alcohol that they've purchased and donated to your project. We can't issue a tax receipt for their time. So if they've, you know, done all of the cooking or if they have, um, you know, acted as a bartender or, you know, opened their home to people, we can't issue a tax receipt for those types of things because they're considered services by the IRS, only in cases where they've actually tangible, given you something tangible to use. Matching gifts um, are something that we also process quite a few of at Fractured Atlas. So many companies will match an employee's donation to a charity. This means, let's say, for example, that um, let's say your, your uncle works for uh, Verizon. And Verizon, as a perk to um, their employees, says that if your uncle gives to a public charity, that they will match that donation and also give to that public charity. So if your donor gives $200 to Fractured Atlas for the purposes of your project, we can then verify to Verizon that your uncle gave that amount of money, and Verizon will then also give $200. Usually the matches, depending on the company, are usually a one-to-one -one ratio, but there are some companies that do two-to-one. So make sure you're putting into your individual appeal letter that if, they're, um, if they work for a company that offers matching gifts, that you can help them complete the paperwork in order to get that matching gift. Um, and then you'll just need to send that paperwork along to Fractured Atlas for us to verify that the gift was received. So um, as I just said, generally the process is going to start with your, your donors make a contribution to Fractured Atlas. And from there, they will need to report that donation to their employer. The employer then checks with Fractured Atlas, and we confirm that we've received the donation. Then a few months later, we get a check from the employer matching the original contribution, and we attribute it to your project. So I wanted to briefly talk about crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is um, it's something that is used online, um, and it uses the collective cooperation, uh, attention, and trust by people who network and pool their money together. So they're usually trying to support a specific initiative or a project. It uses an online community to solicit pledges. It's, you know, sort of word of mouth wisdom of the crowd that generates generates interest and donations, and it helps to provide transparency around your fundraising. There are a lot of different crowdfunding platforms out there. We have a crowdfunding partnership with Indiegogo at this time, and this partnership allows for our fiscally sponsored projects to use the Indiegogo platform, and, um, and we can issue a tax receipt to your donors that give on the Indiegogo platform. The way that it works is that you need to connect your Indiegogo account to Fractured Atlas. We then charge the credit cards and issue the tax receipts, even though your donors are going to the Indiegogo website. The fee for this um, is 10%. It's slightly different than our standard fee, and that is due to PayPal fees that are um, passed along from Indiegogo. So if you do use the Indiegogo Fractured Atlas partnership, all of your donations will be charged 10%. Um, we are also in the process of building some new tools on the Fractured Atlas um, platform that will help you to, to crowdfund for your project. So stay tuned. That's going to hopefully be launching in the next couple of months. 
This is what Indiegogo looks like. Um, if you are interested in using the Indiegogo partnership until our new tools launch, um, it's a fairly standard platform that for crowdfunding. So there's not not too much I'm going to go into detail about that because we do offer a webinar later on this month. Can everybody hear me? It looks like my audio just cut out for a moment. Is, um, can you guys use, yes, great. Thank you, sorry, I wasn't sure if I got cut off. Um, so as I was just saying, I, I'm not gonna go too much into detail about how to raise money through crowdfunding. We do offer a crowdfunding webinar later on this month that is also recorded. So if you're unable to attend, you can find the recording of the crowdfunding webinar on our website. Just a couple of additional resources I wanted to mention. Um, Indiegogo.com is the website for Indiegogo. Kickstarter is a great crowdfunding platform. Unfortunately, we don't have a partnership with them, so we can't issue tax receipts to, um, to don donors that contribute on Kickstarter. The Foundation Center is a great resource for looking for grants, and there's the link on here for crowdfunding sites um, that are pretty exciting. Sorry about that. Give me one second. Um, so I also just wanted to briefly mention a couple of our other programs and services. So our um, Fractured Atlas, as you know, is a nonprofit arts um, and, and technology company. And outside of the fiscal sponsorship program, we also have an insurance program. Our insurance program is focused on business insurance, and what we do is we provide discipline-specific policies for practicing artists. Um, we also have insurance brokers on staff, and we provide simple online tools that help you to find the, the best policies at the lowest rates. So if you're being told by somebody that you need to purchase insurance, we can definitely help you to get access to that. I also just briefly wanted to mention Space Finder. Um, space Finder is an online marketplace that helps you search for space. It is in a number of geographic regions throughout the United States. Um, we are in New York City, Massachusetts, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Austin. Um, if you look on our website, you can find out all of the geographic areas that we are located in. And it's a really great, easy tool that can help you find all different types of space. So um, we do offer webinars every Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. and on most Wednesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. All of those times are Eastern time. Um, we have currently about 10 webinars lined up for this month and you can find all of those on our website in case you're interested in um, in, in learning more about fundraising. Um, I am going to stay on right now to answer any questions that anybody has. So feel free to use the question functionality to chat any questions that you have. Um, or you can also contact us um, by phone or by email. So um, thank you so much to everybody for joining the webinar this afternoon. And if you have any questions, feel free to chat them to me now. Um, but if you if you need to go, I understand everybody has has busy busy days and busy lives. So um, thanks again for participating. So there is one question. Somebody said, "Is this webinar being recorded, and will we have access to our recording after the webinar is over?" Yes, the webinar is recorded, and I will send everybody a copy of it within the next day or two. Somebody asked, how about the Patreon site? Can Fractured Atlas issue a tax receipt through Patreon? Unfortunately, we don't have a relationship with them and that, um, that we can issue tax receipts on there. Sorry about that. Somebody asked, do I have to be a member to access template letters? Yes, you do have to be a fiscally sponsored project in order to access the templates that are available um, for individual appeal letters and for uh, grants. Somebody else asked, what are ways to collect mailing addresses of donors that you only have email addresses for? Um, I mean, I, I think writing to them by email and asking them for their mailing address is one way. You can also try to do Google searches 
So I know that um, our development team at Fractured Atlas uses this as a tool for our own fundraising efforts. But, um, you know, if you know where somebody, the town they live in, you know, their first and last name, a lot of times you can pull up their uh, their mailing address information by, you know, Google searches. Somebody else asked, can you tell us more about the new crowdfunding tool from Fractured Alice? Um, at this point in time, we're not really giving out more information than that we are going to be launching a new product for our fiscally sponsored projects and for 501c3s. Um, that will be launching hopefully by the end of the year. And um, it is going to be integrated with our fiscal sponsorship program completely. So there's going to be a lot of exciting tools on it um, with the, the focus of it being to start with a, a crowdfunding tool, but there will be more educational tools built into it eventually as well. Somebody else asked, how can you find or make your first communication to new in individual donors you don't know? So most of the time, the donors that you are going to be connecting to are people that you know. Um, it is important to keep in mind that if you look at most uh, appeals or campaigns, that over 85% of the people that give are people that you personally know. The others are people that are usually either coming through the people that you know, so maybe they recommended to somebody else that they check out your work, or you've gotten some press. Um, that is really the the only way to get donors that you, you don't personally know. There's not, um, you know, there are online tools that are like you can perhaps buy a list of donors names, but I would not recommend doing that. It's the type of thing that if you've ever gotten um, uh, an appeal letter from somebody that you don't know or from an organization that you don't know how they got your address, I, I would not suggest um, reaching out to people that haven't explicitly um, either signed up for your online mailing list or giving you their mailing address. Somebody else asked, um, if our fiscally sponsored project also concurrently runs a Patreon campaign, are we required to claim those Patreon pledges for or on Fractured Atlas? No, you are not required to have that money flow through Fractured Atlas. Since we can't issue a tax receipt for it, you should just take that money directly. How much, um, somebody else asked, how much pairing up of donors to projects does Fractured Atlas do, if any? we don't pair donors to projects. Um, that is something, again, that donors give to things that they already know about, that they are familiar with in some way, or that somebody has personally introduced them to. If you know we were to um, hand out lists of donors, they would be donors to other projects. And we don't disclose donors information to anybody but the projects that have actually solicited them. So this is something that Soliciting individual donors is really about your, your own network and thinking about how to grow that network and to, uh, and to engage with more people. So that was the same question. Does Fractured Atlas have any lists or suggestions for potential donors? Um, I, won't, I won't repeat myself again. <laughs> Can you talk more about the rules and value of giving levels? So giving levels are um, you know a, a great thing to offer people something in exchange. What you'll find is that probably about 50% of your donors will opt in to taking the rewards and the others won't. Um, rewards can be really simple. They can be as simple as you know giving a, a thank you on, on your website to things that are more elaborate. Um, it's kind of up to you and the kind of work that you're producing to decide what, what the best um, the best giving levels are. But the, the one thing that I will say is make sure that your giving levels aren't going to cost you more than what the donor is giving you and that it's also not going to take you more time than, you know, than, than you imagined. Um, also consider if you have to pay for like shipping costs or anything like that. Really understand what the true value is of what it's going to cost to you to actually deliver those rewards because you don't want to spend, you know, more money than you're actually getting or more time. Your time has value. So if it's going to take you an hour to produce every single 
reward at the $25 level, it's probably the wrong reward to be giving them. So it doesn't look like there's any more questions right now. But if anybody has any other questions that come up, please feel free. Oh, somebody else asked. Um, if the giving level doesn't provide anything tangible, is that okay? Yes, that's absolutely okay. You know, we have people that um, have, I've seen people say that they're going to blow kisses to people. Um, I have we saw a project that was doing a, um, a photo journalism project. And part of what they did was they took like a photo of themselves in every location that they went to and emailed it or texted it to people that gave at certain levels. Um, so it doesn't have to be something like physical that you give to them. I think actually it's better if it's not, especially at lower levels. All right, well, it looks like that was the last question. So if anybody has additional questions, uh, please feel free to email us at support at fracturedatlas.org or give us a call and we'll be happy to chat with you about your project and your fundraising. Thanks so much for joining the webinar today. Have a great afternoon.